Our community has been through a challenging time this year throughout the coronavirus pandemic. So much has changed in the way we function and communicate, but there are still significant decisions to be made by city government arising from the coronavirus pandemic and so much more. So we wanted to provide an opportunity for our elected officials to communicate directly with you and for you to hear from them. We'll talk about some of the big issues arising from the pandemic that affect you, your families, and your neighbors. We'll discuss some of the great stories of people helping others throughout our community. And we'll talk about some other important issues that City Council is going to be grappling with in the months ahead. Welcome to Ward Updates, a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with Ottawa City Councilors. Our guest today is Jeff Leeper, the City Councilor for Ward 15, Kitchissippi. Jeff, welcome. Hi, Mark. How are you today? Hi, thank you. How are you? I am well, thank you. Uh, it uh, feels good to be back at City Hall. We're starting to drift slowly back into the offices. Uh, it's, a, it's a ghost town around here, but uh, it, uh, it does feel good to be, uh, be at my desk. Okay, and we can see your office there. Uh, we're not getting a glimpse into your home like we do so many times on Zoom these <laughs> days when we're having meetings, but uh, tell me a little bit about how this has impacted you, the job that you do, how it's affected your family, your neighbors, and other residents of Mississippi. That's a, it's a great question. I don't know that any of us have really slowed down enough to, to fully contemplate all the changes that this has brought about. Uh, certainly from my perspective as a city councillor, you know, it has fundamentally changed the way I do my job. Uh, being a city councillor usually involves a lot of face-to-face um, uh, -face contact with people. We do a lot of our work uh, in conversation in the same physical place. And, and like many people in Ottawa, we uh, have large been sent home to work from a spare bedroom or from a kitchen table uh, in order to try to uh, continue to to work the work itself uh, has actually intensified significantly. I have anywhere between, say, double and triple the workload as a result of the pandemic, uh, and it's it's been challenging doing that uh, from my home office. One of the key things that we've seen is, uh, for example, you know, development in our ward is always a, um, a, a hot button topic, and we've had to switch those consultations to be entirely offline. There's or online. There are some pros. There are some cons. I really enjoy my once a week uh, pop up meetings with residents, where I sit in a, a coffee shop or a store or a community center, and people are able to come visit me and uh, chat with me for a little while about whatever is on their mind. We've had to stop those. I really miss them as an opportunity to have uh, more meaningful engagement with residents. Uh, I heard about something called Zoom fatigue, where you know the work involved in talking to a camera and trying to see what people's facial expressions are on a screen is actually making us more tired, and I absolutely believe it. I think one of the uh, really interesting things from our perspective as uh, in the office, my staff are all at home. We miss one another. Uh, uh, and the workload has increased as much as it has, partly because people are sitting home. And one of those big issues in Kitchissippi Ward is always traffic. And now people are watching the traffic outside their window day in and day out. It's generated a lot of email. All right, and we'll come back to some of those issues in a moment. But I wanted to talk more about the pandemic and some of the lessons arising from it. What's your perspective on how this is changing the city? What things are going to be permanently altered by what we've just been through? What things will go back to sort of 2019 methods and, and uh, modes of operation and, and how the city needs to adjust? Huge questions, and I don't think we have the answers to those yet. You know, in the first couple of months of the pandemic, we saw thinking about something like uh, city planning uh, swing wildly in terms of what the assumptions are around what things are going to look like post-pandemic. In the immediate aftermath of the pandemic, a lot of people were saying city planning is going to have to change so that we have less dense communities. Uh, we have to plan on um, uh, having people live further 
further afield. They're not going to be making the same commutes they've made. People are going to need more space around them. And that's counter to what the city is trying to plan with things like its 15-minute communities and intensification and building for future transportation needs with the LRT. Now, in subsequent months, we've seen that city planners have begun to think entirely the opposite, that in fact, our resilience depends on things like intensification. But that debate's not solved. We're in the process right now of writing an official plan that is going to describe a, a growth vision for Ottawa over the course of the next 15 years. And we don't know whether people are going to go back to the office or not. I struggle when I hear um, organizations like Shopify talk about the fact that their employees are going to become virtual. For a number of us who have a house that might have a spare bedroom in it, uh, you know what, this has been relatively easy to ride out. But I take a look at my staff where, you know, they're in one uh, bedroom apartments and, and their workspace is their living space and they're really struggling with that. I as an employer can't afford to get them into a two bedroom apartments so that they can continue to work from home. I hear about the stress on the part of residents of, of missing their co-workers, of missing the social work, um, the socializing that happens in the office, and I hear from many people that they want to return to work. These are all huge questions that we do not necessarily understand the answers to yet, and it's going to take four or five years of good social science before we even understand what happened during the pandemic and what that might mean. What I am confident saying though, Mark, is that our official plan as we're planning it right now has got a number of directions in it that I think will not change. We are still going to seek um, sustainability for the city through intensification. Uh, we are still going to build an LRT that stretches further and further in order to accommodate transit in the city. We're still going to pursue the new direction and the official plan around building great public space. And we saw during this pandemic how important that is. Uh, there's a number of planning thrusts that we had ongoing before the pandemic hit that I think in each case become even more important. Will most federal civil servants go back to the office in January or in March or in October of next year? I honestly don't know. But I do know that a lot of the fundamentals of how you build a great city have been unaffected by what we've seen in the pandemic. Let's talk about the impact on public transit in particular. And of course, it, it's impossible to talk about that with also, without, without also discussing some of the issues that have arisen around the launch of light rail a year ago. Uh, it has not gone smoothly, to say the least. Uh, there has been uh, a huge drop in public confidence in the system, concerns about what this is going to mean when phase two is introduced. So. Uh, given that transit ridership has gone way down during this pandemic, what does that mean for the future of public transit in Ottawa? Well, again, I think that depends on how many more people are going to return to sort of the commuting patterns of the past. Are we still going to have a big population of people who live in Orleans or in Canada or in Ottawa West who need to go from one neighborhood 10, 15 kilometers to another neighborhood in order to work. My suspicion is yes. My suspicion is that in a city of 1.4 million people in 2046, that we are going to need to have that transit. But I think one of the things that we, um, you know, is, is really important is that that transit has to work. And the pandemic has been, and I've seen newspaper columnists talk about this, uh, it's been a blessing in disguise in terms of allowing uh, RTG, RTM, Alstom the chance to get in there and hopefully fix their trains. Uh, we're feeling cautiously optimistic, and I've lost track of how many times I've said that now, uh, that we're going to be able to get the appropriate number of cars on the road so that as volumes in increase of passengers will be able to deal with it. Before the pandemic hit, uh, you know, we didn't have those 15 trains. Last winter, and, and forgive me, Mark, I don't remember the number, I think one day we had as few as seven trains on the tracks. We cannot match any kind of need that the city has for rapid transit with that number of trains. 15 gives us the ability to have the kinds of headways we need in order to avoid the station cramming and jamming that we've seen. Um, I, I just think the system has had a chance to, with the, the closures that we've seen during the pandemic, start to work on those issues so that we can have 15 trains, 16 trains, 17, as more and more of them come off the line. 
we've all said we're cautiously optimistic. We've all been burned before. I think back a year ago now to when that LRT first opened, and and we were all so excited. And I count myself as uh, as among one of the the biggest cheerleaders on council for what LRT was going to do. That hasn't come to pass, but. Thankfully, due to the pandemic, we haven't needed it to perform at its peak capacity yet. We have a chance to fix it, and let's hope that it is working perfectly soon. Are you worried, though, that people won't come back because of a combination of new habits having been formed, fear of in getting an infection from others in close proximity of public transit, and all of the much publicized issues about the light rail system? I think it's going to be slow, Mark. Um, you know, the I'm taking the train regularly. I, I take it several times a week, uh, on peak, off peak, and it is empty. Um, I, I will say I'm pleased with the number of people who are wearing their masks, who are following the protocols that have been put out by OC Transpo in order to try to help ensure a safer transit experience. But, you know, there are not a lot of people on those trains. I think one of the I think it is unavoidable that we will start to see the number of people on the trains that we used to, uh, and even more. The city has a limited amount of land in which to um, in which to build, and the land prices where people want to live uh, continue to skyrocket. Downtown land prices continue to skyrocket. We don't have we don't have enough cheap parking in order to be able to enable everybody who wants to drive from the suburb downtown. Even if they wanted to, even if they did not want to take transit at all, they would not be able to afford to park downtown. Many of us are going to be in the boat of having no choice but to take public transit. Many of us are going to return to our offices that will probably continue to be in the big federal campuses and downtown. And the only choice we're going to have in order to get there uh, well is on public transit. The numbers are going to start to climb. They're going to climb even higher as we approach that 1.4 million uh, person population. And, and we have to have a transit system that works. I don't think the pandemic means that we can take, the, take our foot off the gas of LRT builds. It doesn't mean that we have uh, a lot more breathing room in order to be able to say, meh, the train works well enough for a, for a post-pandemic environment. The numbers are going to come back in my view that train has to work. All right, let's talk about the burden that this has put on these finances. Uh, there is a $192 million shortfall going into your budgeting process for next year. How do you think that's going to be resolved and will City Council be able to stay within the parameters that the Mayor talked about in the last municipal election campaign of tax increases no more than 3% Per year, or is it going to require a greater burden to be placed on taxpayers? So that $192 million shortfall uh, assumes uh, the taxation rates that the, the mayor has promised. I think your watchers know, the viewers, that you know I, I have always come out and said we shouldn't be constrained by the mayor's fiscal promise on tax rates, and that if we need higher tax rates in order to be able to provide the services that people want, and if we cannot find savings elsewhere in our budget, that that has to be on the table. No one likes higher higher taxes, I get it. Um, I don't know yet from our staff whether or not they see a deficit that can be addressed within the 3% tax increase. My assumption is that the mayor is pushing them hard. The 3% is, is one of the things on which he uh, is, is strongest, on which uh, he, he fights the hardest in order to maintain. Um, but the you know, it is a huge hole in the budget. And we haven't seen yet that the federal and provincial governments have promised to make us whole with the entire $192 million. Forgive me, I forget the figure that we have on the table right now. We've had a lot of the money, the shortfall that we need, promised to us by the province and the feds, but there needs to be more in order to make us whole. If we are not made whole, if there is a budget deficit uh, that continues of $10 million, of $20 million, we will have no choice uh, but to um, uh, make either cuts or 
raise taxes. And that's going to be a really tricky budget discussion. This fall, we'll see what staff's proposed budget is. Um, I hope by the time they table something that we will have greater clarity on what the assistance package is going to be from the other levels of government. And we'll be in a much better under, uh, position to understand whether or not we can maintain our 3% or whether we need to go higher than that. All right, let's leave the coronavirus pandemic aside for the moment and talk about some other issues. In Kitchissippi Ward, one of the defining issues is growth and development. There has been a lot of intensification in the city of Ottawa over the last few years. That has resulted in a significant increase in development and in traffic congestion and in other resulting issues. Uh, what's your sense of where things stand now? There's a lot of construction going on in the neighborhood. Uh, of course, everything is being viewed now through the filter of the coronavirus pandemic and the changes to people's normal traffic patterns during this time. But what's your sense of where we stand and the concerns that some residents of Kitchissippi have that there's been overdevelopment in the community? Uh, I share a lot of residents' concerns. Um, one of the things that we know is, you know, we have been pursuing a strategy of intensification for all the right reasons for, you know, at least a decade now. In voting to constrain the urban boundary in order not to exacerbate urban sprawl, we know that our intensification targets are going to get even higher. Unfortunately, achieving uh, intensification is going to be done, um, in my view, part and uh, part and parcel. We are we are seeing an ad hoc approach to intensification that is making a lot of residents uncomfortable. And I can describe what some of those concerns that they have are. So, in a couple of weeks, we're going to probably vote to uh, increase the density of the downtown wards by a very significant amount uh, by allowing much uh, more units in small apartment buildings. It, we are in uh, close proximity to, uh, to Hintonburg. I'm in Hintonburg. We are in what's called an R4 zone. The city is proposing that in the R4 zone in which I live, that, you know, we'll be able to, we will allow the number of units in those buildings to increase from four to eight or even 12. The discomfort that residents have is that if we do that, that the city may then take years before it begins to look at intensification outside of those downtown areas. So the areas where you're allowed to build semi-detached buildings or the areas where you're only allowed to build uh, single detached homes. People in Hintonburg, people in Vanier, uh, people in parts of old Ottawa South are concerned that the intensification is being very much targeted at them because new density increases are coming to their neighborhoods first and we don't have a plan for addressing greater density right across the city so that it's not only those neighborhoods that are going to take the brunt of intensification. The other big concern that a lot of us have is that in my neighborhood in Hintonburg, doubling the allowed density is controversial. I won't say that it's universally opposed or universally supported. There's a lot of very sophisticated thinking about the importance of intensification in order to be able to address the sustainability challenges that our city has. But we take a look at our local pool, which is the plant bath, and the plant bath is packed on weekends. The other pool that serves our neighborhood is the Dover Court Recreation, and it is packed on the weekends. The density seems to be coming, and residents are not seeing the plan to ensure that we have enough parks, that we have enough um, uh, swimming pools, enough uh, pickleball courts, enough meeting spaces, that our libraries are going to serve us well enough. We need to see the intensification debate happening a bit more in lockstep with the commitments that we as a city are willing to make to ensuring that we have all the infrastructure we need to support that. Uh, you know, we're looking at putting in um, a significant new density in a lot of these downtown neighborhoods, and, and we're not building the bike lanes in order to be able to ensure that people will be able to cycle around. And yet we're proposing limiting the parking that's available in order to encourage people to live car free. 
Uh, you know, it's there's a lot of moving parts to successfully intensifying a city, and it looks to many of us as if it's being done um, n where nothing is in lockstep, various issues are divorced from various other issues. What about traffic? And um, what results from, from intensification often is traffic. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on where that stands? Because I hear from a lot of residents that they've noticed a significant increase in traffic, notwithstanding the different patterns resulting from the coronavirus pandemic, uh, that they've seen a significant increase in traffic and congestion in the ward. Yeah, and you know that's to be expected. We are adding thousands of new residents in the ward, and you know a lot of the um, a lot of the traffic that is in our ward right now is actually trying to get to some of those exploding areas of uh, Gatineau, for example, by getting across the Island Park Bridge and trying to find a, a quick way to get over there. All across the city, traffic congestion is going to increase, and we know that. And, and this city council's hard answer for residents is that we're not going to be able to ensure that traffic flows freely and smoothly and quickly and still meet intensification goals. I think, you know, my focus is on some of the impacts of what it means when you have much more congested neighborhoods. The worst impact that I'm looking to address is the high speed cut through traffic as people try to get around the really congested arteries and find shortcuts through the residential neighborhoods. That is, uh, that continues to be a huge challenge. Uh, I'm, I'm sure in the course of getting ready for uh, today's conversation, I must have received another three or four or five emails from people who are looking for traffic coming on their street. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is one of the big challenges is, is to try to keep the speeds down um, on the streets that people are using as shortcuts around our more heavily congested arteries. The good news, to the extent that there is good news on that front, is that developing Development is um, is one potential solution to those problems in that it does create funds that we can use in order to try to address the problems that come from intensification. So on all the big new projects now, uh, there are public benefits that are owed back to the community in return for getting zoning that is higher than what the zoning currently is. I've been asking that a fair amount of that is being uh, put into envelopes for traffic calming to deal with trying to keep our residential streets calm and sane and safe. All right, let's talk about the issue of policing in Ottawa. As a result of a continental uh, debate on the future of policing and because of some incidents that happened primarily in the United States, but evidence of systemic racism in Canada as well, uh, there has been a discussion around how to fund law enforcement going forward. What are your thoughts on the idea of, to use the term that's being thrown around a lot lately, defunding the police. Yep. And that's, it's a huge discussion. It is one that has consumed um, a lot of our attention and time, and rightfully so. Uh, you know, I think the uh, assumption that somehow Canadian police are different from American police is um, uh, is naive. Uh, we certainly do see systemic racism within the Canadian police forces. We see it within the Ottawa police force, and, and it, it's historical. It's built into police forces. Uh, police forces, uh, you know, have evolved from a, a place of protecting uh, certain people's property, certain people's lives. And I think they that fundamental root of what policing is continues to rear its ugly head in Canada. And we need to think about stopping that. Defunding is really a... Uh, defunding is a way to stop the historical development of police in its tracks and put something in a new course. Nobody is going to argue that putting money into police is is not as good a use as putting money into um, uh, the social services we need in order to ensure that we don't have the crimes that require police. There, uh, you know, our police are on the street. They're working as social workers. They're working as health workers. Work the police shouldn't be doing. And every time you have an interaction between police and somebody else on the street, there is a risk that that is going to go awry. Um, so 
the defund movement in Ottawa, I think most of us are talking about trying to shift significant resources out of policing and put those into measures that can help deal with the mental health, the health issues, the poverty issues, the housing issues that are at the fundamental root of why a police officer might be having an interaction with somebody on the street to begin with. Um, it is tough because, and, and this is something I emphasize a lot, uh, police are not a city department. Uh, police are an independent organization of the police. On paper, I have the same relationship with police that you do. Um, trying to have a conversation in which, you know, city councillors are trying to find ways to better allocate the resources that citizens are willing to put into issues into things that will actually help is complicated by the fact that you know in many instances we don't control those resources at all it is much more of a provincial discussion but I don't think that you're going to see um, you know certainly I and my colleagues duck from the responsibility to continue to have that conversation uh, you know I've had chats with uh, Chief Slowly about this as well um, it is it is motherhood that we need to find better ways to fund mental health, um, health issues, poverty issues, uh, housing issues. Um, but it is a really complex um, uh, game, or sorry, a really complex uh, uh, landscape. You know, the, 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 the city could today determine that we are not going to pass the police budget. We won't give them a red cent. Um, and we, that is within our purview to do, but we can't then ensure that that money is put into things that are under provincial responsibility, like the, the, the health care that is at the root of so many interactions on the street. It's complex. Okay, we only have about a minute left, Jeff, but uh, I wanted to go back to the pandemic for a moment and just to give you an opportunity, uh, briefly, if you will, uh, to share a few examples of some of the people who have risen to the occasion in your community. Wow, and I, I'm sorry I only have a minute. Um, thank you to uh, the 200 people or so who signed up uh, when I first put out a call for volunteers. We were inundated with people who wanted to help by giving people drives, who were uh, happy to check in and, and phone people who might be experiencing isolation. We had uh, uh, probably five people who were picking up uh, people's laundry and doing their laundry at home because we lost access to our laundromats when those uh, first closed at the beginning of the pandemic. Thank you so much to the Parkdale Food Center. Uh, the Parkdale Food Center, as it always is in these kinds of uh, situations, has been a hub uh, for uh, helping people in the community. Uh, you know, just folks like uh, Jessica Carpnone at um, uh, Bread by Us, who, when she had to close, kept going in to bake bread, got that bread into the hands of folks like the Parkdale Food Center to get it into the hands of folks at the Cornerstone uh, Housing for Women. You know, our, our business community, our residents, and our NGOs absolutely stepped up. Uh, things right. seem better now, but they're not. Uh, there is still a lot of work to be done to ensure that the most vulnerable continue to uh, have yeah. the services they need in these tough times. Jeff, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, and all the best to you and your constituents. Thanks for your time. Oh, I appreciate it, Mark. Thank you very much. City Councillor Jeff Leeper, and that concludes our Ward update for Ward 15, Mississippi. Thank you for watching.